All right, so I shouldn't be here because I'm not an expert in your field. Um, and as I was thinking about what I want to say here and why we're all here, there's a fundamental thesis that I think all of us agree with, which is this. <laughs> and if you needed any further proof, <laughs> just to pick a random picture. So, you know, people have wanted to leave the real world for a long time. This, this isn't a modern phenomenon. This is something that has been going on. And we've been getting better and better at it. And as we get better and better at it, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality, you're, you're trying to find these different interfaces to change, quote unquote, the real world and trying to reach out. And the thesis that I want to leave you with this morning is that there's a lot of ways of doing that. And you know, there's a couple of ways using headsets, and those are moving very quickly, and those have incredible interfaces. But as Patty Mays just said, I think this field's going to get a lot bigger in the measure that it becomes horizontal and begins to reach out to other things and other disciplines and doesn't just stay in the headset space, even though the headset space is already becoming miss mission critical in a series of areas. So this is something that is already becoming a part of training, is becoming a part of life, it's becoming a part of life and death in a series of places. But it really goes far beyond this, right? Because what you're looking at is a little pinnacle or a little fitness mountain in an era of intelligent design. And we're entering an era of intelligent design because we're increasingly altering the ways that our bodies act, the way that our bodies operate, the way that our bodies interact with, quote unquote, the real world. And that means that we're evolving ourselves. And as we start thinking about evolution, we really have to start thinking about evolution as something that is changing and is changing radically and is being flipped on its head. Because for about four billion years, what lived and died on this planet depended on natural selection, random mutation. And as we think about what we are doing, we are unnaturally selecting and non-randomly mutating. And let me unpack that for a second. So a wolf is natural selection. A dog is unnatural selection. Right? You take one of these little yapping chihuahuas that sits on these Hermes bags. You put it on the African plain. You watch natural selection happen. <laughs> right? and, and half of what lives and dies on Earth today is because we want a cornfield here. We want a soy field over here. We want a garden over here. We want dogs over here. We want cities over here that don't have a lot of grizzly bears. And when we take control over what lives and dies, then we are unnaturally selecting and creating a parallel path to evolution. And then what's been happening, especially in Cambridge and a series of other places, is we've been non-randomly mutating living things. So when I went to college, best-selling medicines were all small molecules that came out of chemistry labs. Today, eight of the 10 top best-selling medicines are engineered life forms that make biologics. So Humira, right, is made in cells, and those are engineered cells. And that's not a random mutation. A potato is not a random mutation, right? A potato used to be about that size and poisonous. A tomato is not a random mutation. It used to be the size of your thumbnail, green and poisonous. So we've been engineering life forms in very deliberate ways but now we've got CRISPR, and now we've got a whole series of other instruments that are really changing our realities and are really flipping the logic of evolution in really interesting ways. And increasingly, that gives us control over evolution. And by the way, when you start altering brains with medicines or with antidepressants or maybe even with the headsets that a lot of you are building, you may be changing the wiring of that brain, and therefore you may be changing evolution. So as you go in and you rewire things because the inputs are different, because the structures are different, because the amount of data is different, because the amount of data coming into a human brain in a day is probably the equivalent of what used to come in many people's lifetimes, then you're looking at a rewiring that may be a very different structure. So as you take the augmented reality in biology, let me just take a couple examples from where you're sitting. So this wonderful guy operates about three floors down from here. And he lost both his legs in a climbing accident. And instead of being upset about it, he went out and redesigned himself. 
And when you redesign yourself, then you enter an augmented reality, right? Because then you wake up in the morning and you say, how tall do I want to be today? Or do I want something that makes me run really fast? And in that context, by the way, remember Oscar Pistorius, who used to be famous not because of horrible things he did, but because he was a runner in the Olympics, not the Paralympics? And there was a question, should he be running? Because he's wearing blades instead of legs. Well, let's fast forward that to Olympics. What happened the last Olympics? The people who ran with those blades could have beaten anybody in the 800 in the real Olympics. Right? So you're entering an era where you're not talking about the handicapped, you're talking about the augmented. And so you know, Hugh can now climb stuff that is very hard for other people to climb because his legs can be adapted to that climb. People will be able to run faster. People will be able to lift stuff. People will be able to walk faster. And that shifts the reality of the normal and the handicapped into a very different virtual reality which Tony Atala is working on because he's engineering 32 different organs. So your cells have your entire human genome. Having your entire human genome means your cells have the blueprint to make every part of your body. They can make a stomach, they can make a brain, they can make teeth, they can make eyes, they can make organs. But oh, by the way, while you're making these organs, you can augment them, of course. Because once you know what the recipe is, then maybe you want to make this resistant to that or stronger for that or better able to process that. And so you begin to take the natural, you begin to reproduce the natural, you begin to clone the natural, and then you begin to edit the natural. And you turn it into an augmented reality, and of course we're already seeing that, right? So your great-grandparents, their hearing aids were these giant cones, and they'd kind of swing them around. Your grandparents had these really awkward boxes that sat above their ears, and they squawked, right? You'd get these really loud squawks, and they'd have to adjust them. And today, your parents probably wear hearing aids, and you don't see them. They're transparent. But as you begin to move forward with things like Phonak, then you wear hearing aids that also record, that also serve as a telephone, that allow you to focus your hearing on that side of the room, that allow you to blot out the obnoxious person over here, that may allow you to hear in tones that a bat or a dog or a dolphin might hear. And it becomes a series of changes, evolutionary changes, where you become symbiotic, as Patty just said, with a series of devices that augment your reality on a daily basis. Then you enter a realm of virtual reality. And that's a different realm. And that realm, again, coming to this building, is something that's being built very quickly. So instead of having prosthetics that augment what you do, you have prosthetics that substitute for some of the functions of what your body does. So that's not, I'm going to make a leg that is a different leg, I'm going to make something that looks very different. So what folks like Ed Boyden have done, and by the way, that's the first wet lab in this building, is he's been building a whole series of connections between the brain and the types of interfaces that he was building. So if you connect a prosthetic, a leg, or an arm, using fiber optics and using light, then you get some really interesting effects because your reaction time depends on the diameter of the axons. And of course, you can make those diameters much, much larger and faster if you're using things like fiber optics. So in theory, what you could do is you could connect the brain to the limb in such a way that if you could see the muzzle flash, you may be able to step out of the path of the speeding bullet. That's the order of magnitude of changes that you can begin to think about when you start to re-engineer bodies in ways like that. And of course, that leads to Ed's field, which is optogenetics, where you begin to control the brain directly by using light. So you can begin to think about treating PTSD not with chemicals, but with light. You can induce memories. You can edit memories. You can add memories. And that might have just one or two ethical, political, and social implications. And then there's the augmented reality of being able to print life forms. So one of the companies that I co-founded, Synthetic Genomics, is a company that was based on, let's make an Intel chip, but let's make an Intel chip that doesn't operate in ones and zeros. Let's make it operate in ATCGs, in the code of DNA. Now, once you can have a synthetic life form that is programmable, which we have now built, then you can use these machines, which you're now shipping, 
to program life forms to make what you want. So we are making energy, we are making chemicals, we are making vaccines, we are altering pig organs to be able to tra be transplanted to humans, we're making foods, we're making oils. So life becomes a programmable structure and that again might lead to a series of interesting questions like, okay, so if we can engineer life, not just at the bacterial level, what do we actually want humans to look like? How do we want them to interact with the world, virtual and otherwise? And that's a really interesting question, right? Because it means that we've started a new reality. We may be starting with new memories. We may be starting with new bodies. Or maybe we'll get it right this time. And it's a journey that's going to be a really interesting journey, and it's a journey in which we have to be humble. Because we have these superpowers where we can augment what we see, we can augment how we can influence other people, we can augment our memories, we can augment our bodies, we can augment our interaction with reality. Great stuff. But it's an important journey, and it's an important journey where we have to listen to people who disagree with us. It's a journey where we have to be humble as to how we approach this stuff, and we have to be willing to admit we've done this right and we've made mistakes. And survival in the digital age is going to require at least two things. The first is, at some point, we are going to have to turn off our electronic devices, because interesting as this stuff is, it ain't just life. And I think we need two parallel evolutionary systems. I think we need a system where we control evolution, we need a system where we respect evolution. We should set aside at least a quarter of the Earth and let only Darwinian evolution operate there. And at the same time, we should operate our lives, at least a quarter of it, separate from an augmented reality, separate from a virtual reality, separate from a reality that is a reality that we have created, and live more in a reality which is a closer to nature reality. Last rule. Right? And you really have to think about this. Do you really want your kids doing what you are selling? Do you really want your parents doing what you are selling? Do you really want future generations to do it, profitable as it may be? And that is a really important rule, because you can lose sight of this stuff, because it's cool, because it's interesting, because it's new. But you really have to think about the applications of these things and you have to think about what you're building for the long term and how you're going to alter the human body and the human reality, because that is a superpower. And you're all building superpowers. And that's one of the greatest adventures humans have been on. It's also one of their greatest responsibilities. So absolutely act, but act mindfully, act humbly, and above all, just do it and enjoy the ride. Thanks so much.